<laughs> yeah, the three of us, all, uh, three of us together make one real <laughs> normal sized person. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee. It's March the 7th and it's uh, 1.31. I'm Tony Mancini, the chair of the committee, and uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Um, first thing I would like to do is acknowledge that uh, Halifax Regional Municipality is lo located on Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and traditional lands of the Mi'kmaq people. And here in Nova Scotia, and particularly here in HRM, we are all treaty people. Uh, first up is approval of minutes from December the 7th. Uh, Councillor Morris uh, moves it, second by Councillor Austin. All those in favour? We now have official uh, minutes. Uh, next is approval of the order of business and approval of additions and deletions. Uh, Madam Clerk, any additions or deletions? No additions or deletions have been received by the clerk's office. And just for uh, notice for folks, uh, I do have to step away at 2.30, so the vice chair and deputy mayor will take over at that point in time and make me look bad because she's much more efficient than I am. So. Uh, um, if there's no other uh, comments or additions or deletions, can I have someone move that for Councillor Stoddard moves it. Second by Councillor Morris. All in favor? We now have an agenda. Uh, business arising out of the minutes. Seeing none. Call for declaration of conflict of interests. Seeing none. And then we come to motions of reconsideration, motions of rescissions, consideration to deferred business, notice of table matters, all none. And now we look at correspondence, petitions, and delegations. Madam Clerk, are there any correspondence? No correspondence has been received by the clerk's office. And what about uh, petitions? No petitions, either? No petitions have been received by the clerk's office. No petitions from the committee? Seeing none. N now, uh, we are time for a presentation. Our first presentation is 10.3.1. Uh, Hemlock, Woolly, Adelgid, preparing HRM for its invasion species. And I believe we have uh, Donna Crossland here. Donna, welcome, come forward if you'd like. Is Donna not in the room? So oh, she's online, sorry. She's online, my apologies, thank you. Everyone's giving me the signals. Uh, I should have known that, which I did, but I forgot. And we're gonna check her mic first, Madam Clerk, is that correct? Yes. What well, was that a big yes? Donna, did we have you? It, did you uh, did you hear me just now? Well, it got loud and clear. So uh, welcome. Uh, you have the floor. You have 10 minutes. And then after your presentation, uh, the committee is available to ask questions. So we appreciate your time today. And the floor is yours. OK. Well, we'll need the uh, slides brought up. All, all I see is a great big image of myself, which is it's a lovely. Disturbing. It's a lovely image, and a lovely tree <laughs> behind you. So yeah, and the clerk, yes, will, the, the clerk will let you know when you're uh, almost out of time. But uh, uh, do you have your presentation ready? Uh, it's you. Uh, it's supposed to be advanced yeah, by your office. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. There we go. Uh, just stand by. We haven't started your time yet, so not to worry. Okay. I don't see it yet. Yep. So. Yeah, it's, it's on its way. We just need the Jeopardy theme in the meantime while we get it all set up. I was going to sing a little song or something. Feel free, feel, feel free. <laughs> something about well, the land and the wilderness and the trees. There, do, do you see the presentation, Donna? I do. So okay. I'm ready to start. And so, yes, I am Donna Crossland. I uh, have been working with Hemlock Woolly Adelgid, or otherwise known as HWA. Uh, since 2018, first as a biologist for Parks Canada, and then last year as the HWA project coordinator for the Medway Community Forest Co-op, and we launched our first treatment program last spring, and uh, it's still going strong today. So uh, I've put together some pointers. They're written in red. I've got six main points. Uh, it's sort of a counselor's handbook on what I think you need to do to plan and some of the costs and considerations uh, to prepare for Hemlock Willi Adelgid. Next. I'll just keep saying next until. 
So hemlocks represent a, a large portion of the remaining old growth in our province. It's, a, it's the largest conifer tree we have in the Wabanagi Acadian forest. It lives for centuries. Uh, it forms uh, interesting shapes and large craggy uh, uh, forest structures in, in the forest. Um, those broken lower limbs are just a natural part of its growth form. And uh, so it's just, it's an amazing tree. Next. Next. And it's, it's got very uh, short needles, the tiny cones. So it's got this delicate lacy appearance despite its large size that it can attain. So it's a very aesthetically pleasing tree in the forest. Next. I want to point out that it's also in a very important riparian tree, uh, meaning that it lines our rivers and lake shores uh, very commonly where it can cool and, and shade the waters, which is very important for cold water fish like salmon and brook trout. It maintains our water levels better uh, where there are streams. And it inter it's, on a day like today, we have to think about its ecosystem function of intercepting storm runoff and sometimes here in the southwest, we're having bridges wash out and culverts wash out. And I sometimes think it would have been cheaper to treat the trees upstream and keep them alive instead of them dying off all at once as hemlock is tending to do here in the southwest. Next slide. So HWA is an invasive insect from southern Japan. It attacks only hemlock. It's, it sucks the nutrients and the sap of the tree and it secretes this white waxy wool substance on the sides of its body, which is how it got its name. And, and those, that white waxy wool eventually forms an egg mass all around the insect. Next slide. And so we can expect full stand mortality. Uh, it leaves no prisoners. It hits small trees like it hits large trees, old growth, what have you. Um, there's no natural predators that are controlling it in Nova Scotia. And mortality is, can be quite rapid, we're discovering in Nova Scotia, anywhere from three to 10 years. But along the coast and in the Annapolis Valley, it seems like it's closer to three years before mortality occurs. So this is, um, it's been a riveting experience thus far for people like myself. Uh, oh, and I should say the natural predators, there are some in British Columbia, and you've probably heard that there was a release of one of those last fall in five different areas of Nova Scotia as part of research to get ready for predator control. Next slide. So here's a, a egg mass that was pulled apart so you can see the hemlock oleodelgid eggs. And you can also see how tiny they are compared to those tiny hemlock needles there. And then on the right, there's a crawler. And so there's terrifying effects. Facts associated with HWA is that it only takes one of those little crawlers or an egg to start a whole new population. It doesn't do sexual reproduction in North America. And so one individual can, can become 5,000 progeny in just one year. Next. So we rapidly go from a healthy tree that you see on the left to a dead tree on the right in just perhaps as little as three years. And this was these are photos I took in Bear River. Uh, it's a permanent loss from our ecosystem. It doesn't ever recover. Once we lose our hemlock, they're never coming back. Uh, so it's unlike other native pests uh, that you may get asked about, like spruce budworm. It comes through every 40 years or so, but balsam fir is never fully wiped out. It recovers. In this case, this is a permanent loss. Next. So I was involved in Kejimakujik. I was the project coordinator there for a project called Slow the Spread. And you can see uh, I wasn't very successful. And so these all these red dots are where the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has detected hemlock woolly adelgid. And we know it's just reached HRM, as well as Hance County. And so it's disseminated on people. It's so small we can't see it. So it can be in our clothing, our hats, our backpacks. Uh, it's stuck to the feet and the feathers of little migrating birds uh, and wind pets. It's, it's dispersed in many ways. Next slide. And what we're left with are these gray ghosts. When hemlock it, it just dies, it, it looks like big gray ghosts on the landscape. Uh, so this is down on Sisabu River. And uh, so we're already getting these big uh, dead stands in the Southwest. And so I'm sad to say you're, you're going to be 
soon next. Um, there's cascading effects with this. Uh, so on a cold, rainy day like today, the wildlife like to get in under the cover of the dense canopy of hemlocks. And so they're losing their shelter. There are many other wildlife species and other you know, lichens and flora that will be affected by the loss of the habitat that hemlock creates. Next slide. I bring you this slide in the context of climate change because we know that forests are very important for absorbing the excess greenhouse gas carbon dioxide that's in our atmosphere right now. And there's lots on the news about this. And so we know forests are kind of the natural climate solution. They're how we can uh, mitigate climate change by at least keeping forest cover that's sequestering the CO2 gas. Uh, so Global Forest Watch depicts in pink polygons the areas where the, its satellites detect a loss of forest cover. And these little pink polygons you see right now on the, on the map are just from one year, between the year 2000 and 2001. And now, uh, wait for it, here, if we click uh, again, we'll see the last 21 years of forest cover loss. Next. So all of these pink areas are where the forest has been lost between 2001 and 2022. And so next, these pink areas now, which are where there was forest, and now there isn't, it was clear cut or, or forest fire or what have you, remove the forest cover, has now become net carbon emitting. So it's emitting more carbon dioxide gas, mostly from the stores in the, in the forest floor than uh, the carbon that's stored in the forest floor in the soil uh, after the trees have been removed. And so it's going to continue to em emit more carbon dioxide gas than it can sequester from the atmosphere for the next two to three decades. And so next, I'll just show you. And then, but these blue green areas and other green areas on the map are the areas where there's still hopefully intact forest cover. The blue green areas are our, our, uh, our um, wilderness areas and protected areas. Next, I think it shows, oh, I, I missed my cue, but that's okay. You, anyway, those intact forest areas are still sequestering carbon, but we're, we're much more carbon emitting than we are sequestering. And this is sobering to think about. Uh, so my point was in that last slide was that trees have never been more important than they are right now in terms of conserving our old growth which are the best trees for sequestering carbon dioxide gas and mitigating climate change, that the most important role for our forests right now is to mitigate climate change, in, at least in my personal opinion. And so we have, in HRM, you have many uh, parks, and some of them are quite uh, dominated by hemlock, and they're important wild spaces for your constituents. And I only have a partial list there, but these are, these are very important assets. Next. So the province has adapted a master plan or adopted a master plan for controlling HWA and it goes something like this. We were using chemical control in the short term and biological controls in the longer as the longer term solution. Uh, and in the short term, these chemical controls next, if you can just click once more, are, are done through what we call systemic applications. And that's a new term that probably all of us need to get used to saying that these it means that the chemical is transported inside the tree in the tree sap to the canopy and killing the feeding HWA that are in the canopy. So these are systemic chemical applications and then they're integrated with biological control which we hope that eventually then we won't need chemical applications once we get our biocontrols working. And there's two biocontrols that we're going to need in concert because there's two generations of HWA and Larry Cobius, we call him Little Larry, the beetle on the left, uh, isn't around to eat the second generation of HWA. So we need seconds. Larry Cobius. 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Okay, next. I didn't get to the red parts of the slide. So chemical control is, it's not a first choice, but it's the only choice right now is systemic treatments. Next. So not the, we're not talking about the scenario on the left, we're talking about the scenario on the right. Next. 
And those are targeted applications in small amounts. And these are important things to emphasize either through basal bark application or injection. Next, um, sadly, I'm just getting to the part where it's a neurotoxin for insects. It doesn't affect mammals or birds. Next. And next, I'll just skip because I want to get to that we have to act early. Otherwise, we end up needing to use additional chemical products and it doubles and triples the cost. Next, I'm just going to move right along. I hear you've got a forest master plan, an urban forest master plan underway. Next. So I've got these six red points that I was going to give you. I don't know if we'll get through them all, but one was to request that this plan that's underway address invasive forest species. And maybe that's already, they're already doing that, but there's three forest species that really they need to incorporate and probably have sub plans attached to their urban forest management plan. Time. Uh, Donna, it's Tony Mancini. Uh, uh, I'm going to give you some more time to finish up your, your presentation, please. I'd like to see all six. Uh, I think colleagues were okay with that? Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. yeah it, the, so, so the you, you finish the, the next six and it, it, uh, uh, you don't have to talk real quick, uh, even though it's, that's tough, difficult for me, but that's okay. <laughs> you go ahead, Donna. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I, I, it isn't very long now, but yeah. So number two is decide on this general management strategy now. You need to have a plan because there isn't much time now that you already have HWA. Uh, next. And I'm, I'm suggesting uh, do not reinvent the wheel, that there's good guidance out there already. By all means, ask to have a representative join the HWA Working Group Maritimes. We're a group that uh, exchange ideas. The uh, treatment options report on the top right is a report that I led the writing of. A lot of good information there, and most of it coming from American experts. And it is the plan that really is what the province has adopted and is rolling out presently for protected areas. So a lot of very good information to share with you. Next, point four, allocate some funding for your invasive species. This is not going away. It's with you for the next 10 to 15 years. It's the chemicals that cost a lot. Um, they're expensive. So, it, you know, I think it needs to take up a line on the the register, um, also, the, people love their hemlocks. They love their protected areas, their parks. And so a donor platform wouldn't be a bad idea. Definitely a communications plan is, is required. Um, the Q&As can come from other places, like DNR has a good Q&A, CFIA, Nova Scotia Invasive Species Council. Next, point six. So we're very, oh, point six, and then I've just got a few other points. You've got a tough job ahead to prioritize hemlock forests to treat. Uh, you know, here's a map that shows, again, the blue-green areas next. I'll just say next. So, are, are the protected areas. If there are hemlock within those sites, they'll probably fall under the provincial program. The red areas, which are old forests, old-growth forests, follow under that policy and may or may not be treated. They're still working out the criteria. But then there's all the other places, uh, like your riparian zones and other places for you to consider within HRM. And now just to finalize, next slide. Um, here's, here's the landscape level plan that we're following. I say we because I work so much with the program, both the, with the province, but I'm no longer with the province now. But uh, the idea was to have these stepping stones of conserved hemlocks across the Nova Scotia landscape and then the blue bands would be the riparian zones with treated hemlocks within them. And then those conserved areas would allow the predators to move back and forth as they need to, to flourish on the landscape. And this all stemmed from this treatment options report that uh, we'll be able to share with you in another week or two. Next slide. I really am wrapping up here. This just shows, again, just to keep in mind, you'll want to look at high value hemlocks your park hemlocks, riparian hemlocks, uh, what's what's providing flood control support. Uh, so prioritizing that the fact that we have very little old growth left on the landscape. N next, and I believe this is the last slide. No, it's not, sorry. But uh, just this is how we're rolling it out. So you're probably going to be interested in this. Within seven meters of watercourses, we inject all the trees that are hemlock. 
And then next, beyond the seven meter buffer zone, we have one hectare units and we're limited as to how much chemical we're allowed to apply per year within them. So we might have to re return two to three, four years to get an entire uh, treated hemlock stand next. And I'm suggesting that HRM probably wants to hire their very own in-house pesticide operator because I can tell you me as a private contractor, which I am right now, that's the most expensive option, that having someone trained in-house in because you're going to have to do this over 10 to 15 years, there'll always be somewhere that needs to be treated. Uh, that that's a good idea, probably will save money as well as adopting a strike team approach, which is a US term, but there I am standing with my newly trained up strike team from last spring. And I think this, I think there's one more slide next. Oh, I wanted to remind you, you're not alone. There's other towns getting ready to treat their hemlocks. Canfield, Wolffield, Bridgewater, next. I wanted to mention that Berwick Camp, I was the one paid pesticide operator, but everybody turned out and volunteered from the camp. And it took us just a few weekends to treat the entire 12 hectare camp of, of uh, old growth hemlock that they had there. Volunteers love to save old growth. So integrating volunteers into your planning is a very, very uh, good idea. It's, it's definitely what we're doing with the Medway Community Forest Co-op Strike Team as well. And really, I think there's one more slide and then that's it, next. So Sporting Lake Nature Reserve was founded on volunteer driven. We were all volunteering to conserve this nature reserve and it was a huge success. So just wanted to emphasize that volunteers can be trained to safely uh, drill trees and deliver chemical and it's uh, a lovely spiritual event. Next, there's just some subtitles. So uh, Canoe Kayak Nova Scotia, which is based, I believe, in Halifax, Dartmouth, is thinking of treating riparian hemlocks as a volunteer uh, project and hemlock heroes. I've trained over 100 volunteers now to treat hemlocks. So uh, there's, there's HRM is not alone. And I think I've just got the last slide then next. There you go. Thanks for the extra time. Uh, Donna, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I heard a lot of last slides there at the end, but that's okay. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, look, I have a lot to say, but I'm going to go to my colleagues first because um, that was a very interesting and rather scary presentation. So uh, first up is uh, Catherine Morris has some questions. Uh, Councillor, you have the floor. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation, um, very comprehensive. Um, and uh, we know you're one of the leading experts in the province, so we appreciate you taking some time to talk to us this afternoon. Um, I, I'm just wondering if uh, these treatments, I have a couple questions, maybe I'll, I'll send my questions to you in, um, all in a row. Sure. Um, the treatments would be proactive, I, or would not be proactive, they're reactive, is that right? Well, they, they suggest we treat our old growth, if you have old growth, treat it as early as you can. If you know that HWA is nearby, don't wait for it to come and the trees go into decline because this insect is small and it's easy to overlook, especially when it's high in the canopy. So I would hope that in an ideal world that you can treat some areas of old growth proactively, and but we're, it's getting very hard to get out ahead of HWA. There are states like Michigan that's doing a better job at being proactive. Everybody else is reacting, I think. Okay. So if we were to get out ahead of it, which areas in HRM do you think should be prioritized and how much money do you think should be set aside for programs? Um, I am probably the least informed as to how much hemlock is in HRM and how much of that hemlock is old growth or just really high value, value trees and without them you risk flooding downstream if they're riparian. So I, I, I just don't have that answer right now but maybe I think you've got a forester that's working on the plan if they if you could get the volume of hemlock roughly, or where are the high value sites, uh, 
you're going, but you know, the the province has five million dollars, and it's it's not going to. They got it from Nature Smart Climate Solutions. I I do think that this is going to take an extra funding if you can get it from you know climate change mitigation or um, just conserving species at risk, and that that some of these forest escapes conserve protect. Okay, but. Yeah, a couple of million would help. <laughs> okay, so we're not talking about in the tens of thousands, we're talking in the millions. It certainly how you know, to get it kick-started. You know, I, I guess we've learned lots of ways. I've got lots of ways that now I think of for saving money. And I'm all about saving money because I know that if this is too expensive, no one is going to be able to conserve their trees. So I think we've worked out a lot of the bugs for how to get you to make the money go the farthest. Okay, and um, do, you, do you think that uh, staff, people are needed full-time year-round or is there seasonal approaches that need to be taken? I do think that it would be useful to have one paid staff year-round and in the winter time, even when you can treat up until the ground freezes underneath the hemlock forest. And so you can treat almost nine months out of the year now, uh, but in the winter time, you could, that person could be taking volunteers in and preparing, measuring the trees, flagging them, and getting things site prep for treatments in the spring. So uh, you can almost go year round or, you know, at least a, a 10 month position. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, you have the floor. <clears throat> Thank you for this great presentation, Donna. Uh, you know, this is something that we've been talking a lot about in St. Margaret's Bay in particular, um, looking at the, yeah, looking at the Acadian forests, um, the Dutch elm, we've got the spruce, you know, the loss of the hemlock, like the list keeps going on as to how many species of trees we're actually losing. Um, one of the things that we're very concerned about with that deadwood on the forest for, of course, is wildfire. And so I'm interested to hear from you if you're working to create any kind of mapping, like your maps were amazing to see that evolution over the last 20 years, but thinking about it from a wildfire protective perspective, um, there's a lot of fire fuel there. And so while I'm thinking about the importance of keeping the trees alive, I'm also thinking about the importance of preventing more wildfire and adding to that fire fuel. And so I'm wondering if you've been having conversations around that with provincial government. I mean, obviously, if the only thing the province is looking at is keeping the trees alive, um, we're not really looking at the broad scopes of what this means for the potential for more massive wildfires in the area. Well, well it certainly, in the past, before climate change came, we know that we're not a fire-driven forest landscape and we're marine moderated. So uh, what I find the forest industry likes to emphasize, I know we've all had a very bad scare last year with and tremendous loss, but as a general rule, um, we're a marine moderated climate uh, and things get punky quickly. The, the decay mm -hmm. rate is fairly rapid. Uh, so yes, there would be some fuel build up, but, uh, you know, in terms of spruce budworm, years ago we did a research and really the fuel build up was only for about two years following mortality of, of, of balsam fir in the highlands, uh, whereas in Ontario it was completely different. Right. They, they had a fuel build up. So it, it, is, it, is, it is a consideration, um, but, uh, you know, you've got to have an ignition source. So I think there's a whole lot of things that need to be considered in Nova Scotia about how we stop people from lighting our fires, our forests on fire. Uh, right. And, and, yeah, no, I do appreciate that. I think our concern right now is having mapping information, GIS detail that helps us to be able to do predictive mapping, right? So we have a better understanding. Um, certainly Dutch elm, spruce, uh, budworm, you know, uh, the loss of hemlock. And so it just seems to be escalating. Um, so I'm just wondering from your perspective, is that what you're seeing? Uh, because we've had the last 20 years, but is the next 20 years going to be um, more significant loss that we've ever seen before? And that seems to be the trajectory that, that, that we're headed in. 
It, well, you're quite right. It, it is the traje trajectory that we're headed in, and so I, that's why I, I probably sound fairly desperate because I, <laughs> I see so many of these long-lived trees, you know, the balsam fir, it's a short-lived tree, it's not really built to last, and so when it dies at budworm, it's, it's not uh, a huge deal, but hemlock that's been there for centuries mm -hmm. and is usually cooling the ground and keeping things moist, now it if it dies, yes, it is going to be drier and you're, it's, it, there's more of a fire risk. Right. So there, yes, it's an added reason why we should be treating the hemlock and just keeping, keeping them, keeping the legacy alive. Well, thank you, Don. I appreciate that. It sounds like we need to keep the queen of the forest alive. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, next Councillor up is the other cool Councillor from Dartmouth, Councillor Austin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, certainly humans moving things around and climate change and all this is putting the pressure on our forests uh, with invasive species. So uh, rather sobering. Um, I just had one question and maybe I missed it there. Uh, the chemical treatment, how long is it good for? Like, so you go and you treat a tree, how long is it like a permanent inoculation or do you have to go back after? Do we, what's the effectiveness? It, it's just like us with vaccines. We need our booster shots, I guess. Uh, so if you inject the trees, it, the label says you get four years. We're hoping for five, but you get at least four. If you do basal bark spray, it looks like that lasts longer, and it's about a third of the cost, um, and so five to seven years for basal bark spray. So it's definitely, for a biologist who never thought I'd advocate spraying anything, I definitely have warmed up to basal bark spray. <laughs> okay, uh, that seems to be, you know, so something that's gonna last several years seems like a pretty good deal to me, especially in, you know, some key places. Uh, do we have any sense as to what the trajectory of all this is? Like, so we treat some trees uh, to protect them. Uh, maybe we introduce native species. Is the long-term kind of place that we land on as this becomes part of our ecosystem here in a stable way? Um, or given that this insect exclusively needs hemlock, um, is it something that the population eventually craters on? So, so what I'm looking at is there's this one-two punch, uh, and so we treat the trees. If we basal bark spray, let's say, we'll probably have to come back and spray again in another seven years. Uh, and then I'm hoping that after that, by the time it's time to retreat again, a second time, uh, that maybe the biocontrols will be ready and they will be eating enough of the HWA that they'll control it on their own. So that's my hope is that uh, it's just temporary, maybe two, three rounds of chemical control, and then we can leave that go. Uh, we're, we're done with chemical control, and we can look to the biocontrols to maintain it. So that, that's, that's the long-term plan. And then hopefully hemlock will just be able to maintain itself. Mm -hmm. um, in the parts of the province where it's basically gone, um, is that as we move along in this is the is the thought to reestablish down in where it's been wiped out or do we anticipate that it will you know through the long long process of whatever seeds and whatnot have survived on the forest floor to sprout new over time it's uh, we're probably not going to I wouldn't advise people to invest in more hemlock even though it is my favorite tree uh, and but you know and it's a temperate tree so its range extends down into the US so it's it's a tree that would have been suited for the new climate change reality that's coming at us uh, but now we've got this invasive pest so there's probably other species that we should encourage, whether it's just red maple or oak, um, many of the other species in our diverse Wabanagi forest. Um, and we probably need to do assisted migration, which I would have been dead set against 10 years ago, uh, but bringing in uh, hickory and trees from the southern, more southern regions, they're not going to get here on their own because we're almost an island. And so we may need to think about, uh, we may need to think way out ahead 
everything, all the rules have changed. Yeah, it's uh, uh, startling times to be living in, that's for sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Austin. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so you said the other Dartmouth councillor before, and so I might be a third of the third? Okay, good. I, I was just checking. <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, Donna, for the uh, presentation. I was like, where do I look? I look at you down here. Um, I guess I'm kind of, you started to answer one of the, the questions that I had, thank you, Councillor Austin, just around reforestation options that people might be looking at. And of course, you know, when we think about introducing, uh, you've got an invasive species and then you're going to bring in another one to combat it, what's the, the downside? And I guess, you know, who will speak against this kind of a treatment for the hemlock? So what is the downside of this treatment that um, you would be facing from maybe other environmentalists or other foresters? So I, I'm just wondering what's the downside or, or what that might look like. And you spoke about the HWA working group, uh, the Maritimes, and maybe joining it. So I'm just wondering a little bit about what are the terms of reference for that working group? How often do they meet? What's the expectation? Um, that would be awesome, thank you. I, those are very good questions. Um, I'll, I'll start with, um, I'll get to the downside, but the HWA working group uh, meets once a month. I think it's every, uh, it's on the second Thursday of the month. And so there's one coming up. And uh, it was, it began with just a group of scientists from Canadian Forest Service, uh, CFIA and, and uh, a bunch of us, I've been with it since the, the get-go. Uh, but now it's opened, there's a, a lot of people from representatives from the Mi'kmaq community. Uh, we just, we just uh, welcomed Kenfil to join because they want to treat the Kenfil Ravine, the Kenfil Gorge. Uh, so there's, there's more and more players coming into it and uh, they, just want, it's, they just want to hear the latest and greatest exchange of ideas. So, Certainly, I would welcome HRM to send a representative to just hear what's being discussed. It's usually an hour and a half, an hour, something like that, at, at once a month. The downside to treating, well, I, uh, when I began this in 2018, <coughs> sorry? Oh, sorry, okay. no. When I, when, I, when I began this in 2018, uh, there, there were some... Uh, scientists, uh, not very many, but one or two that um, spoke out kind of negatively toward it. But uh, we had, you know, the U.S. experts at Harvard Forest. You know, I, I just, I've got Dr. David Orwig that I'm conferring with and, and Mark Whitmore from Cornell. You know, these are top universities. They've been researching this for years. And so they're saying, you know, that, no, you need to conserve some of your hemlock. I, the answer from HRM always needs to be, yes, we're treating some hemlock, but we're never going, it's going to be a small, you're only going to ever be able to treat the highest value mm -hmm. hemlocks, and the others will die. And so it's a very small percentage, probably like 1% that you're going to conserve. So the, the downside is definitely the cost for these chemicals at the beginning. Um, so that's why I'm trying to lower the, at least the cost for the wages, um, there's, there's definitely a significant cost saving there and, and using the volunteers is another way. People are really getting worried about our future state of everything um, and so they, they want to help and so there, this is a way to ease some anxiety out there. So the downside, I, I don't see a downside now. Um, we, it's just a good investment for the future in, and it mitigates climate change. So off we go. Thank you very much, Donna. I just, one little clarification question, and that is, um, is there any risk? So one is the treatment, you know, goes right into the tree. And then the second one, that basal treatment, is there any risk to any other species in the forest? Excellent question, and and definitely everybody needs to ask that uh, responsibly. Ask that, and uh, but I can tell you that uh, there's some documents that we can share with you. One that uh, Canadian Forest Service has been researching the non-target effects from uh, basal bark spray in particular. That's the one we were worried about because, as you can see in the tree behind me, 
with the canisters in it, there's almost yeah. no chance of getting environmental exposure from stem injection, but basal bark is, it, it was a bit more worrisome, but it looks like uh, the highest level of just minor contamination is 50 centimeters out from the tree trunk. Once you get beyond 100 centimeters, there's, there's, a, there's really almost nothing detectable. Um, so we, anyway, there's, there's, we're, we've, we've been researching it and we're still researching it. The research scientists at Canadian Forest Service and through the Forest Protection Branch at DNR, DNRR, are looking at this very, very seriously. And we take all manner of precaution in the forest. Like every time I take chemicals to the forest, I double contain it. I, so it never escapes into the environment. There's never a spill. Um, so it's it's th this is a new era of pesticide treatments with this systemic approach. So very very limited uh, contact with non targets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, Councillor Stoddard. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Donna, for this presentation. Um, it is scary. As I'm just wondering if this particular pest and its eggs go dormant in the winter when we have our coldest freeze, or are they like some of the um, other predators that do die off? That's a, that's a wonderful question. And um, when we were all just merely rum runners and we were trading north-south, the pests we brought back <laughs> From the Caribbean, they died. But now that we're trading with Asia, Asian countries that have winters, the pests we bring over here, and this one from southern Japan, has a winter. And oh. HWA is very strange in the sense that it grows and feeds all winter long. And so oh. along about April is when she's gotten the biggest and largest and she's laying eggs because she's been oh. developing and feeding all through the winter months, which is not what we were taught in school about insects can't do anything in cold weather because they're cold-blooded. Right. Thank you. Uh, put a, they had another question. Have you, have you had a chance to evaluate Blue Mountain Birch Cove Lakes area? I haven't. So I'm, uh, I, I, I'm very much down in the southwest, and it's a big oh. trip to go to the city. <laughs> Country girl <laughs> here. But... Uh, the, the Environment and Climate Change Group are, and, and the CFIA, Ron Neville, have been very busy looking okay. at. Um, yeah, um, I'm just an environment doing that. Oh, That's okay. Just, then, just a okay. moment, Donna. We have uh, Katie. Can someone get a hold of Katie? So I can boot her out. Yeah. Just pause for a second here. If you can. Yeah, I don't go ahead, Donna. I think we've got that corrected. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Donna. Me? Go ahead. You have the floor. Mm. Donna, are you still with us? Can you hear us? I, I am, yes. Yeah, yep. you have the floor again. Sorry for that interruption. Apologize. That's, that's fine. So, it, it, yes, there are um, environment and climate change. There are staff that are keeping an eye on all the protected areas. So someone is evaluating uh, that protected area and uh, will, and I, I strongly suspect that HWA has arrived there. So right. we, we need people to go out and check too. There's lots of room for volunteer groups to go and check these areas and they love to be involved. So uh, you need more hemlock heroes in HRM and you have quite a few already, by the way. One more uh, question, if you would indulge me, Mr. Chair. Um, there is an area in Bedford Wentworth called the Hemlock Ravine. And uh, based on what you're saying, that could be an area that is infested have you have you had a chance to look at that area or so i i haven't looked at it i had a picture of it in my slideshow uh, i know it's an important area for um the constituents so uh ron neville canadian food inspection agency would be checking that area regularly uh, but it is it is one of those examples where you may want to get in ahead of it 
and start treating it now so that you don't allow those trees to go into decline. Um, so anyway, I, I, I haven't been doing it because I'm, I'm no longer working for the province or for the community forest, so I'm just out on my own. But I do these things like today because I really want to help you get out ahead of this and do the best you can uh, to conserve your hemlocks. Okay. Great, thank you very much and thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Before I go to Councillor Morris uh, for the second time around, if, you, if colleagues you don't mind, I have uh, some comments to make and some questions from the Chair. Uh, Donna, thank you for the presentation. You know, uh, I, like you, my favorite trees are hemlock. Um, I'm an avid hiker and camper, and I camp all year round, and, uh, you know, Kedji is a special spot for me, but when it comes to hemlock forest, one of my favorite spots in the province is in Scottsburn and the Red Tail area, and I've camped there in the wintertime and throughout the summer, and, you know, you, you identified uh, the many benefits of the hemlock forest, and I remember lots of camping. The canopy keeps uh, the ground floor clear, so it makes it beautiful to, to camp in, and, uh, you're, you know, I think Councillor Austin said your presentation was sobering, and it certainly is, and, and it's actually quite sad. And so, uh, you talked about what the province is uh, doing, and I know you've come from the province, but you know, respectfully, are you? Is it getting the priority from the province that it should? That's my first question, and just because I want to get my time in here. Uh, uh, you know, you. I was. I, had, I wrote down. Okay, what's HRM's role? So I'm hearing, you know, make sure it's part of the urban forest master plan. Look at allocate funding for the actual chemicals. Look at for funding for uh, a pest control person. Uh, look at creating volunteer groups. Make sure it's still is part of our mitigation climate st strategy. And am I missing anything? Is there anything else we should be doing from an HRM perspective? So my two questions are: the province, and what else we should be doing at HRM. Definitely asked for the report, the treatment options report that I led the writing of for the community forest, which was really for environment and climate change. It was for the province, so a lot of really good ideas in there. I, I plagiarized all the best ideas from the U.S. that I could find, <laughs> and I'm proud to say it. So uh, we, we just need to take all the best ideas we can. This is an emergency. Um, I'm sorry there's so many emergencies these days, uh, but... We, we, we don't have very much time to uh, conserve some of these favorite spots. I, I am happy to hear that you you can identify with these hemlock forests and know what it feels like to be, it's a spiritual mm. effect being in, a, in an old growth hemlock stand. Is the province uh, prioritizing enough these hemlock forests? No, not in my personal opinion. Um, they have been working hard, uh, the forest protection, DNR, uh, DNRR, has a forest protection branch. And, you know, uh, we've all seen, I think you will recall that when spruce budworm uh, is uh, on the landscape, particularly in Cape Breton, uh, there's a lot of money allocated. There's millions that get allocated for spruce budworm. And it's a native pest. It's supposed to occur. In fact, there's some forest songbirds that rely upon the budworm outbreak and so it's a part of nature uh, this is this pest is killing off a foundation species of our wabanagi forest because it's not of commercial forest industry concern so much it isn't getting the attention mm. nor is beech because it's not a commercial species and so there's very little being said about it from our department of natural resources and renewables so I would say, no, they're not giving it the priority that they could. There could be more in the budget. And meanwhile, um, you know, environment and climate change, they're trying to conserve their protected areas. Uh, and they, they're working very hard. Um, you know, as well as the people from the forest protection branch, I'm just saying that uh, they probably need to hire more staff and they need more of the budget allocated to this because Everywhere I went in the U.S., I spoke with people who I would, I would end my interview with, do you have any, any regrets or something you would do over that you would do differently if you had a do-over? And every single one of them said, we would have conserved more of our hemlocks. Hmm. 
Uh, well, thank you for those answers. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Councillor uh, Morris, Councillor. Uh, you have the second time around. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And Donna, uh, they, uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Regional Council did support um, a, a council, um, a report to council on the Woolly Delegate last fall. So that report is, is being written and uh, hopefully a plan will come forward soon for how um, we will manage the hemlocks in, in HRM. Um, but just a couple more questions. I think you've, you've answered most of the things I was concerned about, but could you tell us a little bit more about how we can be sure there won't be any toxic effects on water when the trees are treated or injected? And also, with the biological control, these insects, um, where do they come from and, and how are they managed to make sure that we don't have problems, uh, unintended consequences, I guess, with using a, a biological control in this case. Thank you. Uh, so the, the um, just to, I seem to answer things backwards, but um, the insects that they're looking to have as, as biocontrols come from British Columbia. So HWA is on the west coast of Canada and the hemlock trees do not die from HWA there because there are predators that are eating the adelgid. Um, so uh, the little little Larry, as I refer to him as the beetle, is, is a released and established all down the eastern states. And uh, the silver fly is, has also been released in New York State and many other states and is becoming established. And so they're, they've been tested. There's, there's stringent measures now for biocontrols. We've learned from a lot of the mistakes in the past. Uh, and so, you know, they, they, do, they do the the trials to make sure that it only eats HWA. If it runs out of food, it dies, um, things like that. So okay. um, it, it's much safer than it used to be. So I trust that our scientists have learned their lessons. With In terms of water, Another, that's a really good question because we, we definitely don't want our waterways contaminated. But as you can see behind me, this big hemlock tree, um, that the canisters, it's contained within the canister. It goes directly inside the tree. There's, there's almost no chance of it escaping into the environment. But they've, they've even looked at um, taking the needles in the tree after it's been treated to see if the needles fall, will that contaminate the water? Uh, so they've looked at a lot of a lot of the non-target effects, and they're and it's been researched extensively in the U.S. because it's been used down there for a, a couple of decades now, and so it's it, it appears to be very very safe. It breaks down in the sunlight too, which helps. <laughs> okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Uh, Donna, once again, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think by the questions around the chambers here, including myself, there will be some follow-up here for sure. Uh, these forests are very precious, and uh, I'm very saddened by your presentation, but it's also a call to action. So thank you. Thank you so much, Donna. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the questions today. And don't be, don't be scared, the, the country girl will come to the city uh, a little more often too. So, you know, we're, we're not all that big and bad, really. Thanks very it much. Is uh, quite uh, a trauma. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, next up is uh, public participation. Uh, Madam Clerk, you, I see there's no registered speakers, is that correct? Uh, no registered speakers, sir. All right, thank you. So if there's anybody in the gallery that wishes to speak, if this is an opportunity, you can come forward and, and speak for five minutes. So I'll call uh, for speakers uh, three times. Uh, would anybody like to speak? If you wish, just raise your hand. And Would anybody like to speak? And would anybody like to speak? Seeing none, we'll move on to the staff reports. We have 13.1.1, proposed amendments to the Nova Scotia Building Code regulations. Uh, Committee, uh, would someone like to put that on the floor, that motion on the floor? Uh, would the Deputy Mayor please put the motion on the floor? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Move that the Environment and Sustainability Standing Committee recommend that Halifax Regional Council request that the Mayor write a letter to the Minister of Municipal Fa Affairs and Housing urging timely action on the adoption of the 2020 National Building Code. 
second by Councillor uh, Stoddard, was it? Uh, oh, uh, uh, Councillor Moore, sorry. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. Is there a presentation or a comment on the report? There is not a presentation, but there is staff to answer questions, though. Okay. I'm actually, I, I think that the report speaks well to what we need to have done, so I have okay. no comment other than then hope we support this. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, Councillor Morris. Thank you. Yeah, I do have a couple questions. Are, are these for you? Oh, Kevin. Kevin? Okay. The, the handsome guy with the best bow tie since uh, Dubé left us. Excellent bow ties. Yeah. <laughs> uh oh. Okay. Go ahead. Does, does Kevin have to introduce himself or? No, oh, you haven't asked him a question yet. So oh, okay, you, sorry. You All right, that's up to me then. Sorry, I should know the routine by now. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, my questions are just around, uh, I seem to recall there were partners of HRM uh, when we were trying to put forward these requests for the changes to the building code. So who, who were those uh, partners and who are the, the others in the community who are interested in having these higher performance buildings with higher energy standards? Um, essentially, I'm just trying to find out who, who is supporting HRM on, on this change. Kevin just pointed to me, so. <laughs> uh, Shannon Miedema, Director of Environment and Climate Change. Happy to be here, very good question. Councillor Morris, uh, Mr. Chair, through you to the committee. Um, we've had a lot of conversations about, you know, building energy considerations with the entirety of the Halifax network over years. Um, we also have had detailed conversation with SSG, which is our consultant, and they actually did that um, report, which is the attachment to this recommendation report, to do an analysis on what it would actually mean for our Halifax targets if we did nothing or tier one or tier two or subsequent tiers of this um, energy code. and. Um, we are also a foundational partner of the recently launched Building to Zero Exchange, um, which is really trying to bring all of the partners together that work in the building sector, everything from architecture to construction. Um, and we've had, we had our first kind of event and panel. We had the launch in October. We had a panel a couple of weeks ago. And um, HRM is a foundational partner of that initiative alongside the province, Efficiency Nova Scotia, Dalhousie, NSCC, and the Construction Association of Nova Scotia, I don't think and Clean Foundation. Um, and so um, we're kind of on the executive committee, they're hiring, hiring a director now, but it's all about trying to um, make, it, make it a more supportive environment for everyone being able to embrace code change because we 100% need code change to have a chance at hitting any of our early or late targets. So it sounds like there's quite a risk to the Halifax plan, um, but uh, where are the, um, industry bodies, that's what I'm trying to understand, like uh, is the Construction Association of Nova Scotia concerned about this, the Nova Scotia Construction Sector Council, like who, who on the construction side would be, uh, you know, supporting this letter that HRM would be writing? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the councillor. Um, the Construction Association of Nova Scotia is supportive of um, doing the changes that are required and that's why they're a foundational partner of Building to Zero Exchange. Um, they definitely want certain things to make their industry have an easier transition, like consistency across the province. Um, we had requested um, for HRM to be able to require a higher tier to build capacity and, um, and support for that work, but I think that inconsistency is is something that not everyone is comfortable with. Um, in terms of the membership of the Building to Zero Exchange, I think there are over 70 members, organization members now, um, from all across the industry, and I think the list is actually on the website. Um, so yeah, we, we haven't heard a lot of opposition ourselves to the kind of necessity of um, building smart buildings, but, uh, there may be others that have. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, Councillor Lovelace, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for this uh, 
report. You know, we haven't uh, actually received a whole lot of opposition on the Coastal Protection Plan either, um, the Coastal Protection Act, which was um, shoved aside by the province. We had people across this province, across this region, asking uh, for coastal protection. Um, when I look at this, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling a little uh, nervous, shall I say? Um, it, but it, I all, I just, just, this is just a point of, I guess, administrative process. So in this report, there is a footnote that links to a CBC News article that highlights a statement from the province um, where the province, uh, in on December 28, 2023, province of Nova Scotia announced it is indefinitely postponing the adoption of the 2020 NBCs. My issue is that if the province had stated that we should be actually not linking to a news article. We should be linking to the actual statement that the provincial government has issued. And that way we know 100% that that is the statement that the provincial government said. It also would provide um, some detail in that news report, or sorry, in that, in that news release issued by the province of Nova Scotia. I'm just hesitant when we start using um, news articles as resources in our staff reports. Um, just, I'm, I'm not sure if this is something that's I haven't noticed it before, so maybe I'm just noticing it now, but I hope that we're not gonna continue to do that. Um, the reason is because those news reports can be changed. Um, so on one day, you know, you, you may read that news report and it may highlight X, Y, Z, and then two weeks later, the editor realizes, oops, we made a mistake and they're gonna update that. Whereas a news release is an actual factual um, archive document sent out by a government. So I've said enough on that. Um, what I am concerned about is the ramifications for this. While this report provides us with an overview of uh, the situation that we're in right now, I don't really feel like it's given us an update as to well, what's gonna happen now if this doesn't actually come through. So I'm wondering if you can provide us with the next steps as far as staff is, um, uh, what is staff planning to provide council with an overview, um, especially in relation to meeting the targets of Halifax. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> and I, I believe Kevin's going to um, start that answer and uh, yes, Shannon uh, will fill in the blanks after. Indeed. So uh, Kevin Bootler, Manager of Community Energy, uh, through you, uh, Deputy Mayor to the Councillor. So on the first note, that actually, that reference is an error. That reference shouldn't be there. Um, the content actually within the, uh, at the third paragraph, um, it is from the news release that state the delay for more education and training yeah. within the industry. So that, that Reference should not be there, so noted, Thank and you. we'll we'll take that away for future uh, reports. Um, so, on your second question, um, sort of relating to if um, we do, if this does get approved by regional council, what is staff's next steps, or if it goes to the uh, the province and the province the province does adopt the code, what are the next steps? Yes, yeah, so if it does go to regional council, then staff will draft a uh, letter on behalf of the mayor and, and send it to uh, to the premier. Um, but if uh, the uh, the province does adopt the code, what we will do is continue working with our building officials. Um, the for context on um, the folks that are in favor or not in favor, the province staff members at the province, they did a, uh, a readiness scan uh, last, uh, last summer to determine sort of where are we building at currently. Okay. And it was recommended that tier one is, is you know, sort of the lay of the land of what we're doing currently. So adopting that code and implementing tier one really will not change anything. It will just set us up for the opportunity to adopt higher tiers of the code and allow the municipality to work with building, uh, our building officials and the, uh, the building to zero exchange, the, uh, the members of that, to try and increase the adoption to different tiers. Right, so then really it's not going to have a significant impact budget-wise, training-wise, or looking at um, from a hiring recruitment process. We, we are already doing this. For, for the most part, yeah, yeah. that, that okay. is correct, yeah. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, no Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to add one more thing, um, HRM itself is building to a much higher standard than the code that's being proposed, yeah, for our corporate buildings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Lovelace. Councillor Austin. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, fully support this. Um, I mean, we're not going to achieve our goals as a province or as a municipality uh, under Halifax and under legislative targets if we don't get a handle on our building emissions. Because as I recall from past reports, it's like, what, 50% of all our emissions comes from buildings. And, um, you know, the kind of narrative that seems to have been out there on this issue that like, well, we can't do this now. We got a housing crisis. We need to build, build, build. Can't afford to, you know, mess or cause delays with any of this. I mean, to me, it's just a false dichotomy because it's certainly not doing us any favors to build a whole bunch of buildings out there that now, guess what? We're gonna be paying through <laughs> other government incentives likely um, to then retrofit and make more energy efficient and if you want to talk about people who you know you talk about housing affordability uh, guess what something that's built that costs you run less to run that's money back in your pocket so I mean I, I hope uh, I, I'm happy to see us taking a, a stance on this for advocacy that I hope council will follow because this is an absolutely essential one um, and hopefully we can convince the province to change their mind on this and that uh, the two things are part and parcel of the same problem and you can't do one without the other. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Austin. No other names on the list. We'll call for the question. Madam Clerk, do we have to, can we vote by show of hands? Great. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? A motion is carried. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you, Shannon. Can you use mic? Pardon? But we still have quorum. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stoddard. Yes. Um, now we can move on. Uh, motions, there are none. There is no in camera, no added items. Any notices of motion? Seeing none, the date of our next meeting is April 4th, 2024, so we can entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved, Councillor Morse at 2.37. Thank you all very much. It's great. Ta-da.